Can can everybody see the picture and hear my voice? Uh, hopefully. Um, All yes. good. Yeah. Um, this first picture is uh, 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 underneath of a male American kestrel um, that shows the, the sort of classic falcon shape. The American kestrel is the smallest falcon in the New World in North and South America. Um, it's also the most colorful. Uh, I stole this picture off the internet. Don't tell anybody. Um, it's uh, the only falcon in the New World, and maybe anywhere where the males and females have different plumage. It's not real different, but uh, as you can see on the tail, the, the bird on the left is a female, the one that's hanging on the edge of a box, and it has a barred bars across the tail and a, a fairly small black band at the end. The bird on the right is a male and has a tail without any barring and really, except at the end, has a really wide black bar and tail, and it's also uh, some other differences. There's more black and gray in the wings and uh, less barring across the back. So they're sexually dimorphic a little bit and the females are also bigger. Um, so the American kestrel as a whole, as a species, has a very broad range from central Alaska all the way down through Canada, through the United States, Mexico, Central America, and down into South America, all the way to the southern end, down to southern Argentina, uh, with some exceptions. The Amazon basin is one exception. Kestrels are open country birds. They, they need short, grassy ground cover and open space and a place to nest. And the Amazon basin is dense dense jungle, so they, they can't survive there. But unfortunately, the rainforest in the Amazon basin is being destroyed, burned up and converted to cow pasture. So kestrels are actually moving in to parts of that uh, basin. Uh, the birds that we see here in, in Florida in the wintertime, most of those are birds from this tan area that's in Alaska and Canada and the Northern Plains states, and they migrate south. They only, they breed up that far north, but they don't stay for the winter. They move down kind of like the people from Ohio, and they, a lot of them move to Florida. So if you see kestrels in the wintertime in Florida, most of those aren't going to be our southeastern American kestrels. Most of them will be uh, American kestrels from further north that migrate down. Um, this is a picture of a southeastern American kestrel that I took uh, in the middle of Gainesville. There were two, it's a male, there were two males uh, hanging out together. So I'm, I'm pretty sure they were fledglings from that same year and uh, probably came from one of our boxes. This one is eating a cicada. They eat a lot of insects. Uh, it's one of their primary food items. Um, so the original range of distribution of the southeastern American kestrel was about the same as the original range of the virgin lonely pine forests that existed up until about 120 years ago when they when they were pretty much completely logged out over a period of 40 years. Um, the timber industry logged pretty much all of the virgin longleaf pine timber. So the southeastern American kestrel was adapted to the longleaf pine forest of the southeastern coastal plain. And it was a fairly common bird in that forest. Um, this is sort of what that forest would have looked like. This is actually second growth longleaf pine down in the Ocala National Forest. And um, this is on uh, Salt Springs Island, but uh, Riverside Island looks a lot like this as well. So the ground cover is perfect. Just the short grass 
frequently burned ground cover is perfect feeding habitat for kestrels. And the big old pines, as they either die or they get cavities excavated by in living trees by woodpeckers, which happens, the red cockade woodpecker uh, excavates cavities in living trees, and then they get remodeled by pileated woodpeckers and they become available for kestrels. Um, this is the original habitat, basically, um, for the southeastern American kestrel. And there were a lot of them. I'm, I'm sure there's, there are no records, really, but back before the virgin forest was logged 120 years ago, the southeastern American kestrel was pretty common, along with a bunch of other birds in that habitat, the, the red cockaded woodpecker, for instance. But with the logging of that forest, the nesting sites for the kestrels and the, the trees that the woodpeckers needed to create nesting sites were removed. So both the red cockade woodpecker and the Southeast American kestrels suffered rapid population declines. And there isn't a good, uh, there aren't good data for the kestrel, but um, it seems likely that at least 95% of the population disappeared between 1900 and 1970. <clears throat> There's a little bit better data from 1970 till 2020 for the Southeastern American kestrel. And during that period, they suffered, the Southeastern American kestrel suffered another 90% reduction in population. So they've been losing population. They've been going extinct fairly fast uh, for 120 years. And the decline is ongoing. So it's a, the, the American kestrel as a whole is doing pretty well in that broad uh, distribution that covers both North and South America, but the Southeastern American kestrel is in trouble. Um, other animals that live in this same habitat, and gopher tortoise, obviously. Um, Backman sparrow. And I'm going to start talking about potential food items for the Southeast American kestrel. This is one, although I've seen Southeastern American kestrel try to catch uh, sparrows and other small birds, and they're not very good at it. They, I've never seen no one catch one. They, it does happen apparently, but they could probably get an inexperienced fledgling from time to time. Um, but what they do often catch are lizards like this six like six line race runner lizard which lives in that same habitat that likes short grassy ground cover that burns pretty often and has sandy patches and i've seen kestrels catching these uh six line race runners up in swanee county they also catch and eat fence lizards um, which during the nesting season they like to catch somewhat bigger than average prey because they have a grow growing family to feed. So they they um, preferentially go after these, these fair-sized lizards. Um, but the most common thing that they eat is grasshoppers. This is a pair of American bird grasshoppers. They're... Uh, big grasshopper and they fly really well. And and the, the nest and on, in successful nest boxes of Southeast American kestrels, the, the bottom is littered by grasshopper legs, including these drumstick-like legs. I would think the kestrels would eat those young, young drumsticks, but they don't. They strip all the legs off and they eat the rest of it. And they, I think they take the wings off as well. Um, so 
where do the cavities come from? Well, woodpeckers mostly. Um, can't really see this slide on the right. This, this is one flaw in, in presenting this program. There's a red-headed woodpecker right about where I am. Uh, so you can see the red-headed woodpecker in this hole, but you can't see the woodpecker. But the woodpecker in the middle, the pileated woodpecker, is the most uh, important one for making cavities for kestrels. They make nice big cavities that are suitable for kestrels. Um, unfortunately, here in Alachua County and in most places now, that there there aren't longleaf pine forests with big longleaf pine trees and then frequently burned grassy ground cover. This is the what the sand hill, what the up, upland longleaf pine forest looked like in and around Latcher County. The one on the left that shows me up on a ladder putting up a box is at Ishtucky Spring State Park. We put up about six or eight boxes in the park and park asked us if we would be willing to do that and we did. But as you can see, the ground cover isn't short grass, it's taller grass and all sorts of oak sprouts and whatever. It's not very good habitat. Plus there's too many oak trees around so flying squirrels can live here and they can get to the box and that's not good for the customers. Um, and the picture on the right shows a couple interns and, and Eric Amundsen uh, out checking out a box. But this, again, there's too many oaks and not enough big pines. So uh, there aren't enough natural cavities. So most of the habitat that's actually now usable by kestrels in Alachua County and elsewhere and the Florida Peninsula and then central, south central Georgia, where there are kestrels. Most of the habitat that is usable by kestrels is cow pasture. So this is the cow pasture out at the Metzger tract at Watermelon Pond that the county owns where the burrowing owls are. And uh, it looks pretty desolate. This is in the winter time. This shows a, this was a living longleaf pine tree that, and we had put up a, a nest box on it, um, but then it died, and then it didn't stand for very long, and it fell down. I was disappointed in that. I thought longleaf pine snags often stand for a long time, but this one didn't. But in the winter time, the southeastern American kestrels don't necessarily hang around where they uh, come to breed in the breeding season, so. Uh, and, and I think that's the case here. And it would be interesting to have some research by somebody like Ken Meyer to band and radio tag some of these birds and find out, you know, where did do they do they hang around or do they go somewhere else? And if they go somewhere else, where do they go? Um, this is a picture of the same pasture, not necessarily exactly the same spot during the breeding season. And during the breeding season, it's pretty lush with grasses and grasshoppers. So it, it's much better habitat when the birds are actually there. And of course, there's this other little bird that's there too, the burrowing owl. And it, I'm a little curious how much competition there is between the burrowing owls and the kestrels because they both eat sort of the same things. They eat beetles and grasshoppers and lizards and things like that. Um, so we have pastures, but the pastures don't have places for the kestrels to nest. So John Smallwood did a research project back in the night, early 90s, starting in 1992. He put up over 300 kestrel boxes in mostly Levy and Marion counties, and he found that that was the limiting factor. If you put up a bunch of nest boxes, you get a bunch more kestrels. And um, so we decided to do that. So, and we decided to use Boy Scouts and interns. These are three champion interns from our 
student intern program, and they're actually building Bluebird boxes here, but they also build Kestrel boxes. And then we put them up. This is one of the interns. This is Adrian putting up a box. And this is kind of an interesting situation. I mean, we've been learning all sorts of things as we go along. And one of them was, I mean, we've been initially, I got the impression from reading on the internet and reading books and so on that kestrels don't like to nest really close to one another. They don't like to be within a hundred yards and or even a quarter of a mile with line of sight to the next nest cavity. But we were out at, at the Shea property, which is in western Alachua County, west of Highway 241, west of San Flasco Hammock Preserve, uh, a square mile of privately owned land where we have access. And they were two pairs of kestrels that were using nest boxes, one of them to the east and one to the west of this box. But then there was a pair of kestrels that were hanging around this utility pole, a third pair of kestrels. And they seemed to be asking for a box. <laughs> uh, so we decided to put one up. So here, here's Adrian putting up the box. Um, and then we backed off about 50 yards and turned around and looked. And here is a kestrel that landed on the box female kestrel landed on the box, went in the box, checked it out, came back out, and they've been nesting in that box ever since. Every year they've nested in that box and the other two boxes. So we have three pairs that nest on that square mile every year. Uh, there's a fourth box, but it's pretty much always occupied by squirrels. One of the things you'll notice about these boxes, the door, this is the door on the side and it has a little screw where you can grab it to open it up this nail is a latch you pull the latch up and then you can open the side um it isn't put all the way up to the roof there's a half inch three quarter inch gap at the top that's intentional that's to provide ventilation if you look through that gap, you can see that on the other side, there's a triangle that's cut out of the sideboard on the other side to allow cross ventilation across the top of the box. That's one of the things that we've learned is that heat is a problem in April, May, and June. And this helps having a little ventilation, additional ventilation um, is helpful. Um, so we've been putting up boxes. Uh, the, on the right is Eric Amundsen putting up a box out at the Mesker track, and it's been used every year since he put it up. On the left is Joel putting up a box, and this is in Alachua County. This is way up in Columbia County, just, you know, half a mile east of the entrance, south entrance into Ishtuckney Spring State Park. So in the park, we had put up maybe six boxes, and they had put up at least that many more, but there were years when they had they had a dozen boxes and they produced no kestrels. So well, I had put a box up on the west side of, uh, you know, about a mile west of the park and it got used every, it was out in a pasture area on a utility pole and it got used every year. So we decided to put up a box <clears throat> east of the park, right on 27, Highway 27. And um, it's been very successful. So the, the kestrels really prefer to be way out in the open in pasture areas. Um, we've had lots of student interns. We have a student intern program associated with the University of Florida. Um, but we've also had interns, these Interns on the left were for, from Santa Fe Community College. Um, and the the man that's helping them is, is Randy Brown. He's uh, retired now, but he was manager of San Flasco Hammock State Preserve. So we 
he, he got us access to the north side of San Flasco Hammock, not too far from Hag Dairy, and we put up several boxes there. Um, some of them rather unusual. Uh, and then on the right is an intern that just on her own contacted me, Jessica Waddington, University of Florida student, and she wanted to help with the program. I never say no. <laughs> so this, I, I like this picture because it shows a couple things. That, that, uh, she had probably never climbed up high to the top of an extension ladder before. But she was uh, all all for it. She she didn't hesitate, and she put up the box, and then she was really proud of herself. So she's celebrating her victory, her accomplishment. So these uh, these interns help us a lot, but I think the program also helps them and get, gives them confidence and experience, and they really they they benefit from it and they enjoy it. Um, so what do we do? How do we run this program? Well, once we put up boxes in places, the key is finding really good places to put the boxes. And uh, so that's number one. Number two, once we find places and put up the boxes, then every fall, every November, or December, January, we go and check all the boxes and do repairs if needed, uh, evict flying squirrels, um, put in, the main thing we do is put in new nesting material if they need more nesting material. The, the height of the boxes is variable. This one on the left is too high. It's up about 20 feet. Uh, we don't put them up that high anymore. Um, I don't know why I ever did put it up that high. Well, it was, it's in kind of a unique place where there's human beings that visit there. So we wanted to get it up as high as possible, I guess. Um, the, and that's Joel putting some nesting material in. And then this on the right is a, a picture of my current number one champion intern, Miguel. Uh, again, putting nesting material in a box that's out at Gothi State Forest at Watermelon Pond. And then we start checking the boxes during the nesting season, which begins around the middle of March. And we have this wonderful little pole camera. And uh, so we go out and we start checking in March. And uh, there's these, these two students are part of the University of Florida intern program with Alachua County. But these three on the right are uh, self-appointed interns. I mean, they just came to me and said, can we help out? So um, they uh, are very helpful. The, the big guy with the pole is... Uh, He's still here at the University of Florida. He's a graduate student in computer science. His name is Trocon, and he's from he's a student from West Africa. So it's, it's uh, he's very helpful. Um, so what do we see when we put the pole camera in? Well, sometimes we see a kestrel in there incubating eggs. This is a male kestrel. Males and females both incubate eggs. It's more often the female, but it can be either one. Um, this is a female kestrel, and she's demonstrating the fact that the kestrels are often afraid of the pole camera. They, you know, they've been up there undisturbed in a nice, quiet, dark place, and then all of a sudden, this monster sticks its head in the hole. And so this kestrel is flipped over on her back and she's putting her talons out and ready to fight. Um, so it is everything that we do once they start nesting is a disturbance to them. Usually, however, the kestrels 
leave the box before we get to it. They they hear us coming, or when we when we get right close to it, they'll fly out of the box and, and leave it leave it alone. And so we get pictures of kestrel eggs. And this also shows the nesting material that we put in, which is wood shavings. Yeah, the kestrels don't supply their own nesting material. So and that's not quite true always. Um, they in a box that's used every year successfully by kestrels, they uh, litter the bottom of the box with a mixture of bird poop and grasshopper legs. And we don't really have to add any. In fact, sometimes we have to subtract some of that. They It starts building up too high in the box. Um, but this is the sort of stuff we add when we do add nesting material. This is another clutch of of eggs. They're not, their color pattern is a little different from one clutch to the next. They often lay five eggs, but they'll lay anywhere from three to six eggs usually. And then a little later, and if we look in, we see baby kestrels sometimes, and that makes us happy. And these little guys, when they're small, they don't usually react to the pole camera being uh, in, invading their nest. But when they get a little older, they don't like it. These two guys are screaming at the at the evil monster sticking its head into their quiet little nest box. And one of the things, well, we don't have enough man hours, enough time, enough uh, resources to do a really good job of monitoring nesting success in, in terms of how many birds actually fledge. But we do get some of that, and particularly up in the northern part of our area up in Columbia County, Swanee County, Gilchrist County. This fellow, Richard Melvin, uh, checks the boxes more frequently than I'm able to do. And he, he uh, takes the birds out and weighs and measures them and, and puts bands on them. So he bans some of our fledglings are banned. This is from that same box that Joel was putting up near it, the entrance into Ishtuckney. Um, and there were five babies that he banded in that box that year. Um, we don't always find kestrels in the boxes. Sometimes there's a surprise. This, uh, this little owl looks surprised. <laughs> it didn't like this, the pole camera being poked into its box. So it flew out. Erica took that picture up in Swanee County. I love that picture. It shows the pole camera really well, and the pole and the camera. And uh, and it shows a little screech owl. They screech owls have been using this box every year. So there's several boxes that are really our screech owl boxes. And there's a couple more screech owl boxes, one in Swanee County and one. The one on the right, uh, Miguel took that picture just this past year with his cell phone, oh, a little screech owl, and it was in a box at, at Gothi State Forest near water, at Watermelon Pond. If no other critters are using the box, no flying squirrels, no kestrels, no screech owls, no Nobody else than bluebirds will often use the box. They, it, and it, it's great for them. They're very successful when they use the kestrel boxes. Um, one of the common occupants of kestrel boxes, if they're put up where there are too many other trees around, are flying squirrels. This, these are flying squirrels on the right here inside a box. and um, on the left is one that's been chased out of the box. I think it's one of the same squirrels. This is up in Swanee County. Uh, Erica took the picture of the on the left here, and and we took the picture on the right with the pole camera. And these guys 
are a problem for the Kashmis. This is something we've learned while doing this this program, which we've been doing since 1992. It's been, uh, you know, over 40 years we've been doing this. And the flying squirrels will eat kestrel eggs. They'll eat kestrel babies. They'll keep the adult kestrels from nesting in a box. And so we try to avoid conflicts by putting boxes where flying squirrels aren't likely to be able to reach the box. Um, other things that come into the box, uh, we have one box that normally has a fox squirrel in it out at uh, the Shea property. And uh, great crested flycatchers use the boxes from time to time. Um, one thing we don't want to have using the boxes <laughs> are rat snakes or raccoons or feral cats or whatever. So this is a, a rat snake in a box and it looks from the nesting material, it looks like it was a box that had flying squirrels in it. So the rat snake came in and had flying squirrel for breakfast. Um, but we don't want them climbing up and having baby kestrels for breakfast. So uh, lately we've been putting up aluminum sheet metal uh, flashing uh, that, that they can buy it at Lowe's or Home Depot and uh, put a double layer, double band so that it's wide enough so a rat snake can't quite get past there or a raccoon or a cat and uh, in order to protect our baby birds. We lost a nest just this, this year at uh, Metzger Tract at Watermelon Pond. It had Kestrels were using it. We took pictures of the kestrels. We took pictures of the eggs in the box, but it didn't have a sheet metal band on it. And then we came back. Next time we came back, the box was open. The, the little nail had been pulled out. The door was open and all the contents were gone. And it, it appears as if a raccoon had gotten up there and gotten in the box and destroyed that clutch. So we we put those metal bands up. John Smallwood, in his research, where he had over 300 boxes in Marion and Levy counties, up on all of them on utility poles, 16 feet up utility poles. The main cause of mortality for the baby kestrels was fire ants. Fire ants would go all the way up there and swarm over the babies and sting them to death. Um, so we use AMDRO to, we put it around the tree trunk in a band or, you, or utility pole or whatever. And we also look for, for fire ant nests and put a circle of AMDRO around the nest. And we do this every time we go out during the nesting season, March, April, May, June, in order to reduce the fire ant mortality. And, and, uh, and we've been successful at that. Uh, that's something that John Smallwood discovered. Um, this gives you, this is 10 years out of date. It gives you some idea of where we've put boxes in Alachua County. Uh, we, there are more boxes over here in the western part of the county, another 10 boxes or so. And there are boxes elsewhere, Suwannee County, Columbia County, Gilchrist County, Marion County, um, Clay County. So we've, we've put boxes all over the place, but this gives you some idea. Each one of these was a box that we put up. Uh, Carl Miller created this for us, this, this visual graphic. Um, other places where we put boxes, the one that you can't see over here is on a four by four, it's sitting up on top of a four by four pole that we put in a pasture sample, that's going The one in the middle is it's Ron Robinson putting up a box in the Gopher Tourist Rehab area at Watermelon Pond. Those folks ask us to put boxes up 
and they ask us to put them in specific spots and so we did and this one is not a good spot there's way too many uh, hardwood trees around it's, it's going to be used by flying squirrels but uh, but it's in another situation where we put boxes in in different places the box on the left was the first box put up by John Smallwood and Bob Simons back in 1992. And it's on a skinny little whip of a slash pine that was left in a young lonely pine plantation. And I put up the box when we put the ladder on the tree, the tree bent and I managed to get the box up anyway, but it was so unstable that we didn't ever climb back up there, but it produced kest baby kestrels six or seven years in a row. And the neat thing about that is if a box is really successful, you don't really have to go up there and do anything. You don't have to add nesting material because the birds add grasshopper legs and bird poop and they add their own nesting material inadvertently. And the box can be successful year after year without any active management. Tebby Siegel got us to, this is, at the Lake City Treatment Wetland. This is the perimeter fence. And she got us to put up uh, bluebird boxes and kestrel boxes around the perimeter fence. So that was that's kind of an unusual situation. And we took the opportunity to make a silly picture. Um, so that's, that's basically our program. Um, the reason we do the program is because the Southeastern American kestrel, without people providing nesting, cav nesting cavities for it, without the nest box, is, is going extinct. Um, so we've kind of switched the habitat. We've switched them over from Longleaf Pine uh, Upland Forest over to pasture habitat by adding nest boxes. And it works. And so we have a choice here in Latchville County. We can make nest boxes and put them up in really nice places where there's nice pasture that isn't, uh, where herbicides aren't applied, uh, pesticides aren't applied, I should say, and uh, where there's no hunting and, you know, where they're safe. And it's working. These are all birds that were produced in our nest boxes. Um, so that's why we do it. It's, it's our choice. We can let the kestrels go and be extirpated from the county or we can maintain them for as long as we want to. And I personally vote for maintaining them because I like them. So that's, that's that. Uh, so um if I, that I could answer questions um, yeah uh, bob um uh, emily asks uh can you give us an estimate of how many total boxes you have put up over the years oh yeah i should have given numbers um it's about 150 and a lot of those boxes are no longer up i mean that the boss call typically lasts about 15 years so the boxes oh, wow. we put in 92 they're all gone and uh, I've had five active boxes hit by lightning. That's not good for them. Uh, and, and only one case was that it happened when kestrels were using it, but uh, that box got blown up and it killed a female kestrel and her babies. So that, but anyway, uh, yeah, that was sad. Um, but uh, so we have, about 60 boxes that were that are still potentially active and actually only about 20 of them are being actively used by kestrels. Um, about 16 of them here in Alachua County and then some in nearby, you know, Marion, Swanee, Columbia, Gilchrist County. Uh, so we have uh, maybe 20 pairs of kestrels here and there's there's at least a, one pair, maybe two pairs that are still nesting in that's not natural cavities. Um, so 
And then we have screech owls. We have about four pairs of screech owls that are used in the boxes every year. Oh, by the way, folks, um, if anyone has questions, I've uh, given everyone the ability to unmute themselves. So if you have questions, if you have any questions for Bob, you can either type them into the chat box or you can now unmute yourself and ask directly. Yeah. Um, Emily unmute. also asked, uh, what type of wood you use to construct the boxes? Um, we've been using Western red cedar um, for a couple of reasons. One is it's rot resistant. And another is that it's lightweight. So um, when you're climbing up on the top of an extension ladder and handling a box and putting it up there, you don't want it to be real heavy. Um, uh, let's see, Zach, uh, Zach asks, um, Zach, what was your question? Can you hear me? Yep. Hi, Bob. I was asking if um, you face all of the boxes in the same direction, like for east, north, south, west. Um, they don't like the box to be pointed west. They almost never use a box that's pointing straight west if it's right, you know, out in the full sun. Uh, northeast is is the my preferred direction. Sometimes it seems best to bury that a little bit north or east or whatever. But yes, northeast is ideal. Thanks. Uh, Debbie Siegel asked, or um, says, uh, there is a pair of kestrels that appear to be nesting successfully in downtown High Springs for several years. Uh, what do you think about this odd habitat for kestrels? Well, I've been hoping originally when we were putting, we were putting up 20 boxes a year for, for five or six years. And we, we put some, we put two boxes up at the, at the vet school at the University of Florida, which is kind of in the middle of Gainesville. And I was hoping for the sake of the kestrels that they would start to adapt to human uh, dominated habitats. And, and I think potentially they could. I mean, they like to eat lizards and the human dominated uh, suburbia and even downtown Gainesville ha has a lot of brown and olds, a lot of little lizards. So potentially they, they could. And, and the pair of kestrels did use a cavity in, near the Gainesville police station in Gainesville a couple of years ago. Um, so potentially, they could they could start adapting to us. Um, so I'm you know that's great. I hope they, I hope that we see more of that. <laughs> uh, Bob, how many boxes uh, um, are out there at uh, Hey Gary that that um that are part of the program? There's two right now. There's one on the road. If you go in the road that goes up the west side of Hague Dairy and turn in, that's kind of typical the way people go. Um, we just put up, Miguel just put up uh, a brand new box on a big slash pine that's there on the left as you drive in. So if you go in, you'll, you could, if you look for it, you'll see it. And we just put it up. It hadn't been used yet. We had one there years ago that did get used once or twice. Um, and then there's another one north of the main Hague Dairy building complex. And there's a sludge pond, a big sludge pond. And then north of that, there's, there are fields. And there's a kestrel box on a utility pole up there in the fields. And that looks absolutely perfect to me. And every year we see kestrels on the utility wires right near the box and they never use it. And huh. I think that pair, I think that pair of kestrels is using a natural cavity and they like it. So they're just not going to use the box, which is fine. Their choice. <laughs> yeah, I've been seeing that, you know, a, a male and female up in those north 
uh, that that north section of Hague Dairy all throughout the summer. So I, I assume that they were nested. I, I just assume they were using the box. But I think the last time I went out there, a few well, the prior to today, the, I think I remember seeing three kestrels. So they seem to be they seem to be doing fine. I don't know. I haven't seen. I haven't been there enough to know if you know to get a good idea of like how many offspring that they had this this season. But they do. They they have seemed to be there throughout the summer. Yeah, yeah, I think they're 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 clearly southeastern American kestrels, and they're they're I'm sure they're nesting somewhere. And then we have some boxes um, north, due north of San Francisco hammock. Um, so kestrels could be nesting there. And we don't. Well, we have one on on uh, Sealand Creek Boulevard that Debbie Siegel and I put up years ago, and that gets used every year. So they raised babies there. Um, oh yeah, we have some boxes in that area. There's another. Uh, there's another box on the north boundary of Hag Dairy. It's on a utility support pole. It's not very high off the ground, and it's surrounded by vegetation, and it's just in an inappropriate spot. It's never been used by anything. But, uh, you know, initially in the program, we would put boxes anywhere <laughs> until mm -hmm. we learned, you know, where was where was good places and where were such good places. Um, Emily Schwartz asked, uh, do you have to ha do you have to have permission to put boxes on utility poles? Um, well, I can answer that one of two ways. I could say yes. And then we've never gotten permission. Or I could say, well, no, we just do it anyway. And that's the truth is I've asked all the different utility companies. And the only one that would give me permission is Gainesville Regional Utility. Um, but most of our boxes are out in the country. So um, I've been putting them up anyway. I put my name on the bottom of the box and my phone number and Alachua Audubon Society on the bottom of the box. And I've been called a couple times by the utility companies. One of them, a, a person complained about the box being put up uh, across on, on a public right away across the highway from his house. And so they, the guy kind of apologized, said, well, you, they, well, first he asked, did you put that box up? And I said, yes. He said, well, you have to take it down because we got a complaint. And I said, okay. And then he said, well, we're going to have, we have a truck in the area. We can take it down and, uh, Put it beside the pole for you, and so that's what they did. But I haven't had any. Uh, in fact, I've had them switch out poles and put boxes back up. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, better to better to ask uh, forgiveness than permission. Ask me. Um. Anyways, uh, other questions. Um. Let's see, Mike. Mike. Mike Drummond said, um, are you familiar with the nest box work Bill Chitty is doing for the Santa Fe Audubon Society out in Etonia Creek State Forest? Yes. And it's been, it's, and it's been really successful. It's great. Awesome. Let's see. Is there any, you know, for, for, uh, for what are the, what are the best ways that this program, you know, what, what are, the best ways to support it and you know continue it um young blood <laughs> i don't know if any of you've noticed to see this white stuff uh, <laughs> i'm getting kind of old and feeble uh, feeble-minded and physically feeble and whatever um the best thing that can happen would be some energetic um enthusiastic young person just take over the program and continue it that's going to have to happen sooner or later um other than that i mean we get all interns we get all the offers of help we, we need except you know for for the head honcho he needs to be replaced at some point 